And you've always thought you couldn't bear press on nails because of all the active things you do? Well, if you're ready for beautiful, natural looking, easy to apply nails, pre-colored in seven luscious hues, just... Our impulses are being redirected. We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. Oh, the hacker that second time night cut in. The movement was begun eight months ago by a small group of scientists who discovered, quite by accident, the signals being sent through time. He's giving me a headache. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> Must took the hackers months to figure out how to do this. You can be part of the action. Nigma Tech brings the joy of 3D entertainment into your living room. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you my vision. The box in every home in America and one day the world. In local news, Edward Nigma's 3D box has become the rage of Gotham. Rioting occurred last night at electronic stores which were sold out. There's hardly a home without the Nigma Tech box. Critics have claimed the box turns Gothamites into zombies, but Edward Nigma just shrugs. That's what they said when TV was invented. Um, did you know that Albert Pike is buried in the walls of the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, what is the UN Meditation Room? <laughs> It is a place where those who understand the, the religion of the New World Order uh, go to meditate and uh, practice through symbology the religion right there in the United Nations. Okay, so well, thank you very much, Bill, and be careful. You're welcome. Thank you. These presidents and leaders of the kingdoms, owned by Satan, are friends behind closed doors and laugh at the reaction they get from the peasants through the staged events they perpetrate. Sure. There were times when morals prevailed because the church was in obedience to the Most High, but through a series of stumbling blocks placed before them, they fell prey to wickedness, which quickly gave control back to the satanic elite. The whole purpose and desire of what we do is to wake people up from the matrix so that they will see things for what they really are. The average American adult watches more than four hours of television each day. The constant flow of entertainment, news, and information that is consumed by the American public shapes their perception of the reality in which they live. By controlling the dissemination of information, broadcasters and their corporate heads are able to control the masses. The constant, carefully shaped messages on television guide the public to predetermined conclusions. There are questions this morning about how the Secret Service handled President Obama's appearance at the Mandela Memorial. The South African interpreter who stood next to the president admits he suffers from serious mental health issues. Bill Plant is at the White House. Bill, good morning. Good morning, Charlie. At first, the complaint was just that his signing for the deaf was incomprehensible. But then serious security questions were raised when the interpreter admitted that he is schizophrenic with a history of violence and that he was having visions during the ceremony. We will never see the likes of Nelson Mandela again. Tamsankwa John Chi stood just a few feet from President Obama and other world leaders at Tuesday's memorial service, seemingly signing their speeches. The White House Thursday deflected all questions about whether the president was in danger to the Secret Service. For matters regarding the president's secure security, I would refer you to the Secret Service. Mental health issues affect people of all ages, income levels, and cultures. No one is immune. Advocate for and promote mental well-being in your life and to those around you. You're not alone. The more you know. Obviously, they worked very hard on this trip, which uh, came about on short notice. The Secret Service said it had an understanding that the South African government was responsible for vetting the people on the stage for the ceremony and that agreed-upon security measures were in place. But in an interview with CBS News, John Chi admitted to suffering from violent outbursts and hallucinations as a result of his condition, even on the day of the memorial. And when I get an opposite, I see ugly things, see ugly things, but that day I see angels. A South African government minister is calling the selection of the interpreter a mistake and said the government was embarrassed. They also admitted he was not fully qualified and had been hired at a bargain rate. 
In a statement, the Secret Service said that its special agents are always in close proximity to the president wherever he is. Now, they're always in close proximity to the president, but security is always more difficult in a large multinational setting like that. But this case is particularly disturbing because they had to rely on another government, and this individual with a record of violence was not spotted. It's the kind of thing that really gives them heartburn. Charlie, Nora? Disturbing. Bill Plant, thank you. Progress report. It's an older code, Skipper. I can't make it out. You hire mammal. Hmm? Can you read? No. Phil can read, though. Phil? Hmm. Ship to Kenya. Wildlife preserve Africa. Africa? That ain't gonna fly. Rico! As a past grandmaster of the great state of Missouri, I'm very much interested in the Masonic Service Association. In the last war, we had 49 Grand Lodges trying to do the work of one. In unity is strength. This time, when our boys come marching home victorious, none will look askance and say, where was Freemasonry in this hour of need? Approximately 10% of the boys in the service are Freemasons. Another 15% are close kin of Freemasons. Through the association, Freemasonry is meeting the challenge of their great need. At this very moment, in foxholes and on shipboard, beneath the sea and in the air, countless hands are being clasped in fraternal recognition as brothers find one another in the darkness as well as in the daylight. And countless fathers, bravely wishing God's speed to their departing sons, are saying, Boy, when your hour of darkness and loneliness comes, find a Freemason and tell him you are the son of a Freemason and you'll find a friend. And through our great association, the flower of Freemasonry is being made to bloom in the rocky soil of war's desolation. And the fruits of Freemasonry are being shared by every boy and girl who wears the uniform. There's nothing for sale in Masonic service centers. Neither mineral nor metal is the price of Freemasonry service to our boys. And yet, our centers are supported without fanfare or public appeal, because in our heart glows the great light of charity, unostentatious but sincere. Each of us giving generously because we have seen the light and heard the cry of the widow's son. I'm not going to make it. You're going to have to go on without me. Truman! Mr. Sandler! You're going to be late! Good morning! Bring me a dream. Morning! Morning! Good morning! Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> Nothing here is fake. Nothing you see on this show is fake. Okay, he's making his turn on the Lancaster Square. It's merely controlled. Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about the trouble and trend that is responsible one-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now. We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. It's a chef's pal. It's a dicer, grater, peeler, all in one. Never need sharpening, dishwasher safe. You really ought to throw out that mower. You're crazy, you know that. Get one of those new elk rotaries. I like your pen. He's not a performer, he's a prisoner. Look at him, look at what you've done to him. 
He could leave at any time. If his was more than just a vague ambition, if he was absolutely determined to discover the truth, there's no way we could prevent him. Well, I never lived the dream of a prime case And the drama queens, I'd like to think the best of me Is still hiding up my sleeve justice and human rights are non-existent. They have created a repressive society and we are their unwitting accomplices. Who? It's hard to tell. They look just like regular people. They go around the block. They come back. They go around again. They just go around and around. Well, thank you for your help. You're welcome, Jerma. Their intention to rule rests with the annihilation of consciousness. We have been lulled into a trance. They have made us indifferent to ourselves, to others. We are focused only on our own gain. So the good boys and girls take the so-called right track. Faded white hats, grab the credits and made the transfer. fix you some of this new mo cocoa drink all natural cocoa beans from the upper slopes of mountain nicaragua no artificial sweeteners what the hell are you talking about who are you talking to just between you and me marlon i'm going away for a while and the last thing i'd ever do is lie to you wish me luck i'll cross my fingers for you and the last thing that i would ever do is lie to you i mean think about it for a minute if if everybody is in on it, I'd have to be in on it too. They are safe as long as they are not discovered. That is their primary method of survival. Keep us asleep, keep us selfish, keep us sedated. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these things simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. Hero shot. Truman, where are you going? What's New Orleans like this time of year? Party girl! <laughs> Is that the best you can do? You're gonna have to kill me!
feels like the whole world revolves around me somehow. Who are you? I am the creator of a television show that gives hope. I In case I don't see ya, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> yeah. Good morning! Morning, Truman! Morning, Spencer! <laughs> hey, Pluto! Oh, no, no, no! Oh, hurt you. He won't hurt oh. you! My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Mr. Jones owned a cotton plantation and many slaves. One day he was talking to the owner of the plantation next to his, and Mr. Jones was lamenting the fact that times were tough, he was having to work his slaves harder than ever, and was having trouble with some of them being disobedient or trying to run away. The other plantation owner said he knew someone who could help. Day one. One day Mr. Jones called his slaves together so a man named Mr. Smith could talk to them. Before beginning, Mr. Smith whispered to Mr. Jones, Whatever I say, do not contradict me or interfere, and I promise you your slave troubles will end. My name is Mr. Smith, he said to the slaves, and this may be the happiest day of your lives. From today forward, you will no longer be slaves, but free men. Mr. Jones was so shocked, he started to step forward, but Mr. Smith gestured for him to remain silent. He did, only because the other plantation owner had spoken so highly of Mr. Smith's skills. You are no longer the property of Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith continued. You are free. 
No more will you be forced to labor for the benefit of Mr. Jones. Now you can work for yourselves. Now the slaves were all murmuring and looking at each other. Many were smiling, many were looking puzzled. In fact, you are now free to leave the plantation whenever you want, Mr. Smith said. However, since we are surrounded by other plantations, if you leave, some other plantation owner will likely claim you as his own the moment you set foot on his property. So I urge you not to risk your newfound freedom by doing something so foolish. Instead, I suggest that you stay here, no longer as slaves, but as willing participants and part owners of this plantation. Yes, this is now your plantation. Mr. Jones bit his tongue to keep from objecting. For now, we might as well leave Mr. Jones in charge, said Mr. Smith, since he is the only one with any experience at running a plantation, which is quite a complicated thing to manage. But he will no longer be your master, but just another worker on the plantation. In fact, he will now be using his organizational and management skills to serve you. Whatever problems you may have had with him before, you are now all equals, and you need each other to make this work. If we all cooperate and work together, we can all reap the benefits together. In honor of this happy occasion, I present you this new symbol of togetherness and cooperation, this flag, which shall be the emblem of the new free Jones Plantation. He held up the new flag, but most of those listening were still too amazed to respond. And this shall be our motto, Mr. Smith announced. We work together as free men for our mutual benefit, pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. To celebrate, everyone has the rest of the day off. Enjoy your freedom, do as you please, and be back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, so that we may begin work on this great and noble new endeavor as equal free men. Finally convinced that Mr. Smith was serious, the former slaves applauded and cheered. Day two. We all want this plantation to do well, Mr. Smith said at the beginning of the next meeting, so we can all share in the benefits. We all know that it takes a lot of effort to make a cotton plantation work. Just because you're all free doesn't mean you can stop working. In fact, since you're now working for yourselves, I expect you to work even harder than ever before, but now with pride and joy, knowing that you're working for yourselves. Of course, there still have to be rules. If everyone just does whatever he wants, the plantation won't produce anything, this experiment will fail, and we'll all starve. You should be thankful that Mr. Jones has agreed to stay on to lend his knowledge and skills to this endeavor, and I trust you will all do your own part to make this work. Several of you have been chosen to act as project supervisors to manage different aspects of the operation, to make sure everyone is doing his assigned job, to make sure that the rules are followed, and so on. The rest of you may head out to the fields to start your first day of work as free men. Day 3 The next morning, Mr. Smith had a grim expression on his face as the daily meeting began. I have an unpleasant duty to do today, he said. Yesterday, Charles was caught keeping some of the cotton he picked, presumably to sell for his own personal profit. That is against the rules. That is stealing. For that, Charles must be punished. Two men tied Charles to the whipping post. I take no joy in this, Mr. Smith continued, but you must understand, if we do not maintain order, if we do not have rules that we all abide by, then the plantation will fail, and we will all suffer. The whip cracked against Charles' back. But if we all pitch in for the common good, then we can all prosper. Being free doesn't mean you should be selfish and greedy. We must each do our assigned duties and obey the rules, and then we can all benefit, and each of you will receive your appropriate share of the profits. A young man named Samuel stepped forward. But if you and Mr. Jones decide the rules and whip us if we disobey, how is that any different from what we had before? How can you say that, Mr. Smith asked. I'm shocked. You were a slave before, and now you're free. Things still need to be managed and organized by those best qualified to do so. Do you know how to run a plantation, Samuel? Well, no, he answered. But if we're free, why do we get no say in what the rules are and how things work? I'm surprised at your ingratitude, Mr. Smith answered. None of you know how a plantation is run, so you're in no position to be making decisions about how things are done here. You don't seem to appreciate all the things that Mr. Jones provides for you, from protecting you from all the outside threats that you know nothing about, those who would come here, capture and enslave you, if not for Mr. Jones' protection, to making sure that you all have food and housing, tools to work with, you're cared for when sick and injured, and so on. There wouldn't be a plantation at all, no cotton to pick, no land to plant and harvest, if not for him. You should be grateful that he's made possible the level of comfort you now have. Your lives would be far worse, if not for him. Nevertheless, as free and equal participants in this endeavor, from now on at each meeting, any worker may have two minutes to ask questions or voice suggestions or complaints. With that, the workers all seemed satisfied and headed out again to the fields to pick the cotton. What's happening? Don't tell me what's happening! I'll report you! You're
What now? stations around the country come to be owned by the you know, fewer and fewer players, there's more and more cost cutting that goes on in the newsrooms of these stations. You know, when you look at a media environment where only five or six companies control the vast majority of the world's media, and they work in collaboration with each other, and they share members of boards of directors and things of that nature, like in the same way that I say we have to broaden our concept of subliminal, I think we also have to broaden our concept of what a conspiracy is. Day four. I have a big announcement, Mr. Smith said as the daily meeting began. Mr. Jones' cousin is here, and not just to visit and see how our project is coming along. It has been decided that from now on, you will be deciding who will manage the plantation. Of course, this job can't be done by just anyone, but every three months we will have a special meeting at which all the workers will vote on whether we think Mr. Jones should run the plantation or whether we think his cousin, Mr. Johnson, should run the plantation. That means that ultimately you are in charge because you will be deciding which man you want running things on your behalf. If you don't like the way things are being managed, you now have the power to change it. Amazed and pleased, the workers headed out again to the fields to pick the cotton. Days passed, months passed, a year passed, and the plantation continued to operate as before. Sometimes Mr. Jones was in charge, sometimes Mr. Johnson was in charge, but the day-to-day -day routine stayed exactly the same. The workers worked hard, long hours every day, and still had little to show for it. Every day the meeting would begin with them all reciting the Jones Plantation motto, We work together as free men for our mutual benefit, pledging our allegiance to the Jones Plantation, which stands for prosperity, liberty, and justice for all. One day, Mr. Smith announced, Samuel has asked to say a few words this morning, and whatever the rest of us may think of his ideas and opinions, we are all free here, and that means we are all allowed to speak our minds. So, Samuel, you have two minutes. Begin. Samuel stepped forward, looking scared. I was excited when all this started, he began, glancing nervously at Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. But don't you all see what's happened here? Nothing's changed. We're all still slaves. There were grumbles of disagreement from the crowd. They tell us what to do and whip us if we don't. They still make all the rules and punish us if we disobey. They let us make suggestions and complain about things, but they never really change anything. They let us choose between Mr. Jones and Mr. Johnson, but what's the difference? The situation stays the same. We do all the work and they take as much as they want and decide how much they'll let us keep. They live in luxury, made rich by the cotton we pick. We do all the work and have to build our own huts, grow our own food, and take care of ourselves. They leave us just enough that we don't revolt or run away. This is not freedom. We're all still slaves. They've only changed the words they use, but nothing else has changed. They say we're all free and equal, but we're not. They command and we obey. That's not freedom. That's not equality. They say we're free to leave, but all that means is that we're free to be someone else's slave. Why should we work or obey the rules? We didn't agree to this. They made the system. They forced it on us. They control and rob us and call it freedom. They've deceived you into thinking that being able to choose which slave master you'll work for is the same as being free. It's not. Open your eyes. If you keep what you produce, they call it stealing. When they take what you produce, they call it sharing and fair distribution. Can't you see that this is all your time? He's up, Samuel, Mr. Smith announced calmly. At his gesture, two supervisors grabbed Samuel by the arms and led him to the whipping post. I'm sorry, Samuel, but you've broken the rules. There are rules against encouraging others not to work and encouraging others to break the rules. You're only hurting all of us with your discontentment and your complaining and your disobedience. The whip fell and Samuel let out a grunt. 
Without rules, without order, all would be lost. Without law, there would be chaos. We can't just behave as wild animals, each doing whatever he pleases. We must all follow the plan and all do our duty for the betterment of everyone. And those who do not must be punished. The whip fell again and blood flowed freely from Samuel's back. Samuel, it is you who are stealing from the others. When you don't do your assigned work, you are making more work for others. When you disobey the rules, it is you who are endangering the future of everyone else here. You are the thief. You are the criminal. You are the one trying to destroy the arrangement that keeps us all safe and prosperous. At every lash of the whip, the other workers cheered louder and louder, some yelling curses at Samuel. Being spoiled and selfish, you complain about everything, talking as if you're oppressed. But you are the one ruining things. You are the one keeping us from being all we could be. It is your greed and your rebelliousness that is hurting all of us. They all play by the rules, Mr. Smith said, gesturing at the others. What makes you think that you don't have to? You think you're above the law? There were loud yells of agreement as the whip fell again. We must maintain order, Mr. Smith proclaimed. To make this plantation great, to make it so that we can all be happy and prosperous. To have the society we want, there have to be rules. We all have to contribute our fair share to this great endeavor, and we cannot tolerate actions and attitudes that seek to undermine the amazing things that together as free men we have achieved and will continue to achieve. Mr. Jones was smiling as he gave Mr. Smith a pat on the back. The crowd was cheering so loudly that none of them had noticed that Samuel had died. Cruel social media remarks. Facebook comments have been pouring in after four people died while hiking. So you're dealing with an addicted generation. This is a big time bomb ticking. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um. Uh. No. People who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. It'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. To be human means that you are persuadable in every single moment. It, it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, it's not about what someone knows, it's about how your mind actually works. We now know that many of the major social media companies hire individuals called attention engineers who borrow principles from Las Vegas casino gambling, among other places, to try to make these products as addictive as possible. We are all vulnerable to social approval. We really care what other people think of us. When you upload a new photo of yourself on Facebook, that's a moment where our mind is very vulnerable to knowing what other people think of my new profile photo. And so when we get new likes on our profile photo, Facebook knowing this could actually message me and say, oh, you have new likes on your profile photo. It knows that we'll be vulnerable to that moment because we all really care about when we're tagged in a photo or when we have a new profile photo. I mean, I think we can all feel it. And it's as if we've been infected. It's as if we've, you know, they've drilled a hole in the back of our head and now they've injected the virus and now we walk around searching for feedback using social media. We know that Engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive. So let's dedicate this to General Kelly, the Border Patrol, and the ICE agents for doing such an incredible job. All right. This was written by Al Wilson a long time ago. And I thought of it having to do with our borders and people coming in. And we know what we're going to have. We're going to have problems. We have to very, very carefully vet. We have to be smart. We have to be vigilant. So here it is, the snake. It's called the snake. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. The border. <laughs> take me in, O oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a comforter of silk and laid him by her fireside with some honey and some milk. She hurried home from work that night, and as soon as she arrived, 
She found that pretty snake she'd taken in, had been revived. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed that vicious snake. She clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, oh heavens, you would have died. She stroked his pretty skin again and kissed him and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Sighed the vicious sake. I have saved you, cried the woman. And you've bitten me, heavens, why? You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Does that explain it, folks? Does that explain it? Trust in me. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress. They don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person. They're turning to social media. They're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. That's a problem. That's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, you're, not just, you're just not that important to me, right? So you have a, 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 an addicted generation that doesn't have the, the skill set to ask for help. Combined with the fact that they're so good at Facebook and Instagram, they're good at putting filters on everything. So they're good at showing you how smart and strong they are. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue that they were depressed. People look like they have a much better life than they really do. People are posting pictures of when they're really happy. They're modifying those pictures to be better looking. People basically seem they're way better looking than they basically really are. And they're way happier seeming than they really are. So if you look at everyone on Instagram, you might think they're all these happy, beautiful people. And I'm not that good looking and I'm not happy. So I'm a suck. Some of the happiest seeming people, actually some of the saddest people in reality. Social media isn't real, but you don't ever see real life. The 99% of our lives, the behind the scenes, the unglamorous, unfiltered, day-to-day, -day, bland normality. And you end up comparing your behind the scenes to other people's fake highlight reel and using others as a mirror or benchmark for how you should look, how successful you should be, or how you should live. You'll become your happier self when you stop putting pressure on yourself to be more like someone else and they know that this causes depression. 
They're injecting things into your head that you didn't ask for. Our lives are becoming more transparent, just inevitably, it's just pulling us. It'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. If you've messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? No. Many of you missed your prom, sporting events, and celebration with your friends, but you were quick to find new ways to stay connected and active while remaining focused on finishing your education. You prove to the entire world that you can set your mind to something important, push through and succeed, showing all of us that you, our next generation, already possess the a future that Ernest Klein, the writer of the book, envisioned. I was very careful with Ernie collaborating with me every step of the way to be able to find the movie narrative inside this dense forest of Ernie's profound imagination. The Oasis being the ultimate toy box with all the toys in the world and then playing that with one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. It results in just amazing action and such a fun adventure. Ernest Klein is such a visionary and I think has seen the future before any of us possibly could even imagine it.